Hi guys, it's Sandy Beeler here and I'm here to discuss uh, the fourth number of Little Dorrit, which is chapters 12 through 14. But before we discuss this, just think about the titles of these three chapters. The first being Bleeding Heart Yard, a very strong image. Second being Patriarchal. And the third being Little Dorrit's Party. And just think about whether you think Dor uh, Dickens was meaning these as straightforward titles or possibly ironic as you read. So let's wander over to Bleeding Heart Yard. And we're wandering because that's what everybody does in this novel. Okay, so Bleeding Heart Yard introduces us to a part of London where the tradesmen live. And let's take a second to appreciate that he introduces this part of London as the place where Shakespeare plied his trade as well. And his trade was simply author and stage player. You gotta love it. Okay, so uh, this place, Bleeding Heart Yard, is teeming with life. And then we see Mrs. Mr. Plornish's house, and it also is teeming with life. Mrs. Plornish has, is disheveled. She's got children all about her, one on her hip. Um, there is a possible shadow of death, as we learn from her that that child is, is a bit sickly. Um, so pay attention to where this might go. Uh, but in general, this is a place of life. And uh, Mrs. Plornish has a wonderful uh, linguistic tick, which reminds me of my son, who always says, I'm not going to lie. And um, she has, starts almost every sentence with, not to deceive you, <laughs> which is quite wonderful. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, Mrs. Plornish is also the storyteller for Mrs. Mr. Plornish. Uh, she gets his narrative duties because language just isn't his friend. It's just too nuanced, too full of paradox, too difficult for him. He stops and starts his sentences and often, quote, does not see his road to any comment. Language is not his friend and he's ready to get swallowed whole by, by language. And yet, by the end of this chapter, when he and Arthur Clennam are trying to dis decide how to help Tip out of his financial difficulties, his language becomes very clear, very clear and short sentences because this is where action is involved. And Mr. Plornish can, can speak about actions. It's the rest of that difficult stuff that, that trips him up. And he also tries very hard to, to understand the, the world. And his illogical opinion is, if you couldn't do nothing for him, you had better take nothing from him for doing of it. That makes perfect sense to me, <laughs> but poor Mr. Plornish. Okay, so the next chapter or the central chapter of this number is patriarchy, uh, patriarchal. And when we think of, and uh, of course, this is another house. This is Mr. Casby's house. And Casby, uh, this is not as bad as Arthur's Clenham's mother's house, of course, but this is yet another place of silence. Um, of, of, let's see, gloom and silence where so it is sober, silent, and air tight, and no sound or motion can penetrate other than the clicking of, a cl of the, the ticking of the clock. Um, it's no wonder that uh, uh, Arthur Clenham's head is spinning at the end of Casby's dinner, because this is a dinner with almost nothing clear. First of all, we get we, we are introduced to Mr. Casby, who is all shiny surfaces and seeming. Pay attention to the language about him. He is always seeming to do something or seeming to be. He is maybe not what he seems to be. Um, and what do you think of when you think of the patriarchs? Um, these are the, the patriarchs of the Bible. We think of calm, confident, caring people. Mr. Casby, is he that? Is this chapter that? Or is he allowing all those shiny surfaces to impress us and shine back at us what we think we want to see or hear? Um, and also let's pay atten real close attention to the language about Panks and Mr. Casby. Panks is the little brown tugboat. But remember, what is a tugboat? A tugboat is the pilot and the power that brings that big ship into to harbor. So pay attention. And in the dinner party, Mr. Casby is speaking, Mr. Pl Mr. Panks is speaking, and poor Arthur doesn't know who to answer because mostly it's Panks, but it seems to be coming from Casby. What's going on here? 
We'll have to see. But language, again, Flora Finching. Pay attention. She is sort of, I don't know, a stomach sickness of language. She is just diarrhea. She is just words pouring out of her mouth with almost no sense and no meaning. And then there's uh, her name, which is one of my favorite Dickensian names, Flora Finching. Flower Finching, which actually sounds more like something you should be arrested for than a name. And then there's somebody else in this chapter that we're introduced to. That's Mr. F's aunt, and she doesn't even deserve a name. And pay attention to her. She uses language rather aggressively out of the blue. Um, <laughs> and it's also meaningless, but aggressive. So um, at the end of this chapter, there's a question and an answer. And the answer is Little Dorrit, who starts the next chapter of Little Dorrit's party. And again, um, the narrator tells us at the beginning of this chap chapter that it's necessary for him to shift to Little Dorrit's point of view. So that's what ha what's happens. And we look at her life from her point of view as she wanders this evening. Um, think about this. Little Dorrit is a woman in a child's body. Maggie is a child in a woman's body. Little Dorrit is, is little mother. Um, Maggie is like her little child, although she's almost twice her size. And there is no place in London for them. They wander throughout the whole cold, awful, gloomy night with no place to settle. Um, and that, at the end of the chapter, is where the narrator comes back in and tells us, this is Dorit, Little Dorrit's party and this is London's shame. But then again, if you ask the question of this novel, of this novel, what's going on? Maybe we have to remember the, the title that it originally had before Little Dorrit. It's nobody's fault. So bear that in mind as you continue reading. Thank you.